I think today's a nice day for two unrelated problems. And not only are they unrelated, but they're from totally different areas in mathematics. Okay, so let's jump right into it. So the first one is almost like some sort of additive version of L'Hopital's rule. So it says that if a is bigger than zero, and the limit is x goes to infinity of f prime of x plus a times f of x equals l, then that means that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is l over a. And so I think this could be applied to some sort of situation where you can calculate this type of limit fairly easily, but the limit down here is difficult. So I think maybe a good follow-up to this video would be for you guys to maybe construct an example where this result is useful. Okay, so anyway, what we wanna do first is look at the inspiration for our solution. And I think the inspiration is built off of this object right here, this f prime plus a times f of x. And what we wanna do is look for some sort of maybe object that describes this as one piece, if you will. So let's see, we've got a derivative plus a times a not derivative. So that's almost looking like the product rule has been applied, but not quite. But in fact, if we multiply by a function, perhaps we could mold this into something that looks like the product rule. And let's perhaps multiply by e to the ax and then take the derivative. So we've got e to the ax times f of x, now we're gonna take the derivative. Now why e to the ax? Because exponential functions have this nice property that when you take their derivative, you get, well, whatever the multiple of x is in the exponent times the original function. Okay, so anyway, if we take the derivative of this, what are we gonna get? We're gonna get e to the ax times f prime of x plus a times e to the ax times f of x. But now we can factor an e to the ax out of this and we'll be left with f prime of x plus a times f of x. And there we have it. We've got this object that we've got some sort of knowledge of over here. Well, let's maybe start with the limit that we want, not the limit that we have. So we've got this limit as x goes to infinity of f of x. And then what we'll do from here is multiply the numerator and the denominator here by e to the ax. So now we've got e to the ax, f of x over e to the ax. And all of this is born out of the inspiration for this formula right here. Now, I'd like to check pretty quickly that we have an indeterminate form. So as x goes to infinity, e to the ax goes to infinity. And then e to the ax times f of x will also go to infinity. And I guess there's some sort of assumption here that we haven't said carefully, and that is that in fact this numerator goes to infinity. So let's maybe add that to our problem over here. So let's just say here we are assuming the following, and that is that the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the ax times f of x is, well actually I'm gonna write here plus minus infinity, because we want that infinity over infinity indeterminate form. Now, why did we hold off on writing that initially? Well, because it would kind of give up the solution strategy here. And I think it's nice to look for this trick on our own. Okay, so anyway, now we're gonna apply L'Hopital's rule, meaning that we need to take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator. I'm just gonna jump straight to the derivative of the numerator as above, because we've already done that. And then that derivative of the denominator is e times e to the ax. But now let's observe that this e to the ax and this e to the ax will cancel. And then we're left with, well, one over a times the limit that we know. This is a limit that we are assuming, which means our final limit is l over a, which was exactly what we wanted to show. Okay, so now let's look at our second problem. And the second problem is to find all integers x and y so that y cubed is equal to x cubed plus x squared plus x plus one. And the strategy here, or maybe the inspiration here, is we'd like to notice that y cubed is most definitely a perfect cube. But then perhaps this x 
cubed plus x squared plus x plus one can be put between two perfect cubes. So let's see how that might go. So let's maybe just go ahead and suppose we have integers x and y solving our equation. So in other words, we know y cubed is equal to x cubed plus x squared plus x plus one. And now we wanna make two comparisons. And the first one is y cubed versus x minus one cubed. And then the second one is y cubed versus x plus one cubed. Okay, so how can we make these comparisons? Well, I'm gonna look at the difference here, and if we can show that the difference is bigger than zero or less than zero, then we have an inequality. Okay, so let's look at y cubed minus x minus one cubed. Okay, so let's start by replacing y cubed with this expression for x, so x cubed plus x squared plus x plus one, and then we'll simply multiply out the x minus one cubed. So that gives us x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x minus 1. And now let's observe that we get some simplification. So observe that this x cubed will cancel this x cubed. And then after that, things are going to build up, if you will. So we've got x squared plus a 3x squared, giving us a 4x squared. So that's going to be minus 2x. And then we're going to have a plus two. Okay, great. But now let's observe that the discriminant of this quadratic is in fact negative. The b squared minus 4ac is negative. But if the discriminant is negative, that means we have no real solution. But if we have no real solution, then that means that this expression is either always positive or it's always negative. But it's pretty clearly always positive here because it's positive at x equals zero. So that means this thing is, like I said, always positive for all, well, for all real numbers x, but also for all integers x. But that means we can go up here and maybe replace this y cubed versus x minus one cubed and say that y cubed is in fact kind of obviously always bigger than x minus one cubed. Okay. So now let's go to our other comparison of y cubed with x plus one cubed, and we're gonna take the same strategy here. So let's do y cubed minus x plus one cubed, and then we'll replace y cubed with the expression that we are saying that we've solved, or the equation that we're saying that we've solved up there, that x cubed plus x squared plus one, and now we're gonna subtract x cubed plus 3x squared plus 3x plus 1. And again, we're going to get some cancellation. So we get this x cubed and this x cubed, this 1 and then this 1. And then after that, we're going to have minus 2x squared and then minus 2x, which is pretty clearly equal to minus 2x times x plus 1. But now let's observe that that's always going to be less than or equal to zero. So how do we know that it could be equal to zero? Well, when x is equal to zero, it could be equal to zero. And when x is equal to negative one, it could also be equal to zero. But notice that it is always negative outside of those places. If x is bigger than zero, then we have a negative two times a positive times a positive, which is less than zero. If x is less than negative one, then we have negative two times a negative times a negative, which is also always less than zero. So that means we can go right here and we can replace our verses with, let's see, uh, less than or equal to, just based off the fact that we got a minus for this calculation here. Okay. And now we've compared y cubed with two perfect cubes that are fairly close to each other. So now we're ready to finish this off. Okay, so putting those two inequalities together that we had on the last board, we have y cubed is bigger than x minus one cubed, but less than or equal to x plus one cubed. But now observe that there's only one perfect cube between x minus one cubed and x plus one cubed, and that's x cubed. So we can change this inequality to uh, greater than or equal to by replacing x minus one cubed with x cubed. 
But now this is gonna split off into two cases. Again, because only two perfect cubes will satisfy this type of equation. So we either have y cubed is equal to x cubed, or we have y cubed is equal to x plus one cubed, which I'll write out as x cubed plus three x squared plus three x plus one. But now we can go back up there to our expression for y cubed in terms of x cubed plus x squared plus x plus one. And this first equation is gonna pretty quickly go to x squared plus x plus one, and it's gonna be equal to zero. But you can easily check that there's no solution to this within the integers, and we are working within the integers. So that means this is our only possibility, but this breaks down to 2x times x plus one equals zero fairly quickly. Actually, it's exactly the same as the calculation that we did before. But now this splits into two cases. We either have x is equal to zero or x is equal to negative one. Now if x is equal to zero, y is equal to one. And then if x is equal to negative one, we see that y is equal to zero. And that gives us our two solutions. So, and in fact, those are the only two solutions. And that's a good place to stop.